The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I'm sure, like me, you have been uh, paying a lot of attention to everything that's been going on down in in Houston, Texas, and the surrounding area, and the rest of the Gulf Gulf Coast as they are living in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. Uh, A good friend of mine uh, named Stephen is a a pastor down in Cypress, Texas, and uh, he he and his family were one of the, the lucky ones who didn't have any flooding in their homes. And uh, Stephen, who's a, also a pastor down there, has spent the better part of his last week, actually, that's, that's a, say it, to say it mildly, has spent the majority of his last week helping his neighbors and organizing his church to, uh, to work in, in rep- repairing neighbors' homes and people who have been damaged by the floods. They've been going around taking out the, the wet drywall and insulation and carpet, doing everything they can uh, to help, help the houses dry out before mold can take hold. Here's uh, Stephen cutting uh, with his Sawzall. Uh, he's, he's a really handy guy, uh, and uh, I really relied on him a lot in college, actually, for a lot of his, his skills. And uh, he, they even had a picnic that someone brought all this food uh, to help all the people. You can kind of see in the background how many people were helping out at some of these homes uh, to, to bring the community together of, of people at their church and other uh, locals. And uh, now their church is even... Uh, gathering supplies for all the victims of, of Harvey. People who have lost not just their carpets and maybe even a, a photo album or two, but their entire homes. People who two weeks ago had everything they need and now have absolutely nothing. You've probably heard of all the folks who have, have taken the charge and uh, have maybe taken their boats down to the flooding, not to joyride through it, but as one person put it, to, to save lives with what they have. Uh, One guy I heard on the radio named Jose Martinez has been driving his big pickup truck with giant tires that can go right over the water, driving it all around the neighborhoods that that he's in to try to find people who may need transportation to and from places in these flooded areas. And he said, I'm very proud of the people here, honestly. You hear all this stuff these days about whites and browns and whatever. Right now, it doesn't matter. I see wherever we need help, everybody's there. Even though folks like like Jose and Stephen and others have lost little to nothing in the tragedies down in Texas, these folks are giving up so much for the sake of others. As Jesus says in today's gospel, those who lose their life for God's sake will save it. See, the situation in, in Texas is tragic, but can you imagine how much worse it would be if everyone had decided just to take care of their own interests and focus only on themselves and not their neighbors as well. It's no secret that self-sacrifice leads to a better life and a better world. 
That's why Jesus, in this week's gospel, asks us to do that very difficult work. He puts it plainly, pick up your cross and follow him through suffering, death, and new life. Not for your sake, but for the sake of God and God's people. Now, Jesus isn't talking here about accepting whatever situation life throws at you. This isn't about those transformative benefits of loss, as if the only reason people suffer tragedy is so that God can teach lessons to the grieving. That's not how God works at all. No, Jesus is talking about voluntarily giving up, deciding on your own to let go of your pride and your stuff, to give up your time and even your life in order to make this earth a bit more like God's kingdom. See, it's the difference between losing your house in a hurricane and opening your dry house to those who need a place to sleep. Imagine what the church on earth would look like if Christians spent far less time being concerned with our own survival and invested so much more in the survival of our neighbors. What are we willing to let go of so that God's love might flourish all the more? Sometimes, like in Houston right now, the opportunity to take up our cross and follow Jesus is as clear as rain. Mostly, though, we have to tune our senses to the will of God as we, as we perceive the needs of our neighbors. Because Jesus is always inviting us to follow his path, not just in times like this, but always. And the promise of new life on Christ's road is marked with suffering, sacrifice, and yes, even death. As the theologian David Lose puts it, he says, that's the hard part. Because giving someone another chance, instead of writing them off completely, forgiving someone who has wronged us, instead of seeking retribution, being open-handed and generous with the resources we've been blessed with, instead of holding on to whatever we can, offering our future to God rather than planning each step, seeking joy in service rather than acquisition, because we've accepted that the world has offered us all that there is. Lo says, these different things often at first feel like death, even like dying on a cross, before God uses them to raise us up to new life. It can be hard to imagine that giving up can lead to a fulfilling life. But that's what faith is all about. Is there anything keeping you from committing your full life to the pursuit of life and love for all of God's people? In today's gospel, when Jesus talks about the path before him, it doesn't sit well with his right-hand man, Peter. You know, the guy who just last week Jesus called the rock of his church, and now a few verses later, he calls him Satan. It's quite a turn on Peter. But really, Peter is appalled that Jesus would have anything to do with self-sacrifice. It's not what he had expected from the coming Messiah all these years. You see, part of Peter's problem is that he believes there's another way. He doesn't want to admit the high cost of discipleship, let alone the path that Jesus is bound to. He hasn't quite grasped that this Jesus movement isn't about power or survival in the here and now. Because new life, real, lasting resurrection for all people is only possible because first, all the hopes of cultural power and self-preservation were left to die on a cross. Jesus did not come to overthrow Rome. 
He didn't come to establish a long-lasting, independent kingdom in Israel. The Son of God came to give up all the divinity and all the perks that come with it, as Paul says in the letter to the Philippians. Jesus came to die so that an entire world, broken by the selfishness of humanity's deadly misdeeds, might live. So may you be like Jesus. May you give up your comfort and discover freedom. May you give up your pride and see creation from the perspective of the destitute and the oppressed. May you take up your cross and follow Christ on the road that leads to new life. Amen.